a senior fellow at Catherine and Shelby Cohen uh, Davis Institute for International Studies. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Mike Gonzalez. It makes even less sense for Hispanics. 
Hispanics, which is a category created very recently, by the way, it was created in 1977 by a, a director from the Office of Management and Budget. Um, it's all residents with ancestry in, these, in, in this group of country. But this, this category makes very little sense culturally or from any scientific perspective. This, this man, uh, David Ortiz, Bobby Ortiz, from the outfield here in this town for the Boston Red Sox, he's Hispanic. You want to know her? Cameron Diaz, she's Hispanic. Bruce Chen from Panama, played for the Kansas City Royals, also Hispanic. And George Lopez is Hispanic. So, what am I saying here? All of the races in the world fall under this umbrella of Hispanics, right? <clears throat> and yet, the government, and this has real, real life consequences in our lives, the government says that somebody who is deemed to be Hispanic, his or her daughter, should have an advantage over somebody who is of Chinese origin, even if the Hispanic, quote unquote, is the son or daughter of a lawyer or a doctor or a scientist, and the son or daughter of a Chinese American is, is the, the son or daughter of a laborer, somebody who worked at a factory. So, you know, this makes, as you can see, very little sense. Somebody talked about uh, Turkey voting for Thanksgiving. For, uh, Thanksgiving. What, I, what I use is the Stockholm Syndrome. The Stockholm Syndrome in, uh, derives its name from a, a, a robbery in Stockholm, Sweden in 1974. Four people was, were held uh, uh, hostage. They ended up developing a, 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 a feelings for the hostage taker in sympathy for him. And he refused to testify at, the, at his trial, at the hostage taker's trial. <clears throat> and then they, they, they waste money for him. Um, but Chinese Americans are not the only ones who suffer uh, uh, from this system. You know, Asian Americans are 5.6% of the population, and Chinese Americans are less. The system really harms all society. Let's um, consider what we got here. It, uh, the, the first major case is uh, uh, the, the, the case known as the Regents of the University of California Davis versus Bakke, known as the Bakke case, in which uh, the Supreme Court held that uh, diversity, a word again, was sufficiently compelling for race to be considered for admissions. Then another case, which was very important, which was uh, uh, Bruder, where the court held that quote unquote, it, it, there are educational benefits that flow from an ethnically diverse student body, quote, uh, quote unquote, and that, that represents a compelling state interest that you, justifies the use of race in admissions. So, let's go back to that, when I talked about group proportionalism. If, if proportionalism means that an office or a, le or, or, or a legislature or a class should mirror society, if your group is 5.6% of the population, which is the case for Asian Americans, once you, once you get out of whack with that, it's not a very, very, very diverse student body. <clears throat> so an Asian student body at USC is 50%, USC San Diego or UC Irvine is not very diverse, and 43% at Harvard is not very diverse. And yet, we know from a Harvard study from 2013, Harvard itself said that if only SAT scores and only uh, GPA were used, Asian Americans would re reach about 43% of the high of the student body. So, but let's go back. You, you talked about principles, discuss principles. What does it mean that there are educational benefits to be had from a diverse student body? <clears throat> it means, it's, it's it actually, once you deconstruct it, it's a very anti-rationalist, anti-enlightenment idea. It means there's racial knowledge. <clears throat> There's ethnic knowledge, and that, that is epistemic or factual relativism. It means there's no objective truth. It means that I, for example, have uh, perspectives and knowledge that I bring from my ethnicity, my DNA, and so do you. We, have, we, we, we are there to teach our lived experience, and we have racial knowledge that come with our DNA. That is a very dangerous notion, and it's a very anti-enlightenment and anti American notion, actually, I can say that. <clears throat> uh, especially because these groups were confected by bureaucrats. Asian Americans were confected by bureaucrats, Hispanics, you know, Pacific Islanders. There was, was going to be another one for me now, Middle East, North Africa, until President Trump put a stop to it um, uh, last year. No, early this year. 
Now, the people who created these groups, a lot of them have good intentions. We should not impugn their motives. But nearly all, and I have looked at this, nearly all were influenced by theories that came out of Europe in the mid 20th century and were an attempt to smash the narratives that existed, uh, <clears throat> the, the narratives uh, of the Enlightenment, of, of the idea that we're all born equal with uh, free and equal and this condition that we share with all of humanity. These, <clears throat> that, that's the modern view. The other view is the postmodern view. The postmodernists and the critical theorists, theorists thought that that was all wrong and that got in the way that was all that truth did not matter, truth did not mean anything, that truth was a, a bunch of language games and was constructed to keep the oppressive class in place. <clears throat> And only monolithic groups, collectives, would be able to emancipate the mad and marginalized and uh, create a counter narrative. Now, what is interesting about the Harvard case is that it smashes all of that. It, it gets rid of all that. Asian Americans with a great GPA and a great SAT score do experience discrimination. Chinese Americans tell me this all the time. Indian Americans are, you know, very cruelly treated sometimes. We've got jokes about Apu from The Simpsons. And yet they succeed. And we'll get to that later. But, but it smashes this idea, this postmodernist idea, that there's an oppressive class and a bunch of uh, subservient classes that cannot succeed because of the structure of the American system. Um, and by the way, at the same time that, that postmodernism was emerging in Europe and in France and Germany, Mao in China was creating the red categories and the black categories. Uh, which are really stem from the same idea. You know, the, the, the red categories, I guess, were the, the, the farmers, the black categories were the supposed uh, capitalist rulers, and people who were born into these categories had advantages or disadvantages. That had nothing to do with what they had. A you know, Chinese American woman said to me, You know, I came to this country to get rid of all that, to get away from all that. And here I come into government categories, and people having benefits are being penalized as, as, as a consequence of being born into this category. Um, so all of these worldly ideas, by the way, the man who created the term Asian American in the 60s, I forget his name now, he was a Maoist. He was an American from Berkeley, of course, uh, who, who, uh, who was influenced by Mao. But the proponents of, of racial preference would say, well, you know, it's only one element, the plus factor, it's a holistic. Uh, approach, but holistic is a nice Greek word that means everything taken taken in. And one of those things is race, which means race is a deciding factor. Well, this is, look at what this does. So it harms it harms Chinese Americans. You know that. You know that. You don't need me here to tell you that. Let's look what it does to the people in whose name was been directed. Right? There's three harms at least, and many others. One is mismatch theory. That's the theory that if you have not been in a competitive environment, K-12, all of a sudden you're thrust, thrusted into a competitive environment in, in, in at, a, at an elite school, you're not going to perform well, you're not going to, you're not going to compete, you're going to get really frustrated, you're going to drop out, you're going to change your major, you, so there are fewer doctors, fewer scientists, fewer lawyers from your uh, given category. The second one is very success. Let's not kid ourselves. If you get into Harvard or, or Princeton or Yale or any competitive school Chicago as well, Stanford is going to be an Ivy, and you come from one of the groups that is protected, you're going to have a stigma on the rest of there are people who are going to say, or going to think, not everybody, but there are some people who are going to say, you know, you only got into Princeton because of your last name. And this is really going to bother you if you worked your butt off, if you didn't watch TV, if you didn't party, if you did your homework, and you did the search your place at Harvard, and somebody's questioning it because of who you are. This is going to be really offensive to you, the fact that the stigma is attached to it. And if you believe it yourself, it's even worse because we know from all the data that you only enjoy the things that you earn through your own success. If you have a shiny red car, you enjoy it if you earned it. If your mother gave you money, you, you really don't enjoy that much. And if you earn the lottery, you don't enjoy that much. You, it's, there's, a, there's a component to earn success about the things we have enjoyed. And there's the last one, which is group spokesman. I already talked about that that you, you, you're seen, it is a benefit to be derived from your presence in the classroom, you're seen as a spokesman of your group. What if, you, what if you're an individual and you don't, want to, you don't feel like speaking for your group, you're not an ambassador for your group, you still expect it to. And there's every, every, every expectation that you should speak for your group. 
So what causes success in America? You know, let's, let's get down to the real, the real reasons people succeed in America. And I'm not saying racism does not exist. There are evil people. We're not going to be able to get rid of evil people. But is that what really holds people down? As I said, Chinese Americans and Indian Americans face discrimination sometimes, yet they're able to succeed. So what accounts for that? Well, they, this, these are, these are uh, data from the Center for Disease Control. This is the adult by birth, the unmarried birth. Uh, the kids who are born to unmarried mothers. As you can see, Asian Americans are extremely low. Sadly, the other groups are all very high. The divorce rate uh, for women age, uh, ages 35 to 39. By the way, these are, this is all the same across all the age cohorts, but I didn't want to have like six lives, so I just picked this one being, you know, where, where women have a lot of children at this age. As you can see, again, uh, Asian Americans do not, do not get divorced at the same rate as the other groups. Again, it's a sad statistic, but it's true. And this is the number of kids growing in a household where the parents are married. And you can see very high for Asian Americans and very low for the other. By the way, let me go back to the other slide because